Welcome to Early River Civilizations, 3500 BC to 1200 BC. This is Melinda Cole Klein. In previous centuries, the area now known as Iraq was formerly an area history remembers as Mesopotamia. This river valley emerged in ancient times as a civilization. Because of its fertile river valley systems, though unpredictable in nature, this area swelled in population as the domestication of plants and animals took shape. Other river civilizations emerged as well. These included peoples of the Nile in Egypt, those living along the Yellow River in China, and people of India living along the Indus. In time and across the centuries, the civilization and cultivation of crops and animals combined with the ability to harness water power as a resource led to population growth. What kept like-minded peoples together was their ability to develop institutions such as religion, government, and military structures along with social norms. Early cities did not always succeed. Some city-states that did not enjoy peace or access to water did not survive. Between times of war and peace, most societies fell into two patterns that were their alternatives. First, there was interstate warfare, also known as civil wars, or they could be wars for succession. Secondly was imperial conquest by outsiders, conquered by a power stronger than themselves, usually militarily advanced or technologically superior to their own society and government. As long as powers had their own laws, not shared laws and practices between groups, war was the likely result. We are in this pattern today. From ancient to modern times, civilizations wage war usually for the following three reasons. Number one, conflict over ideological differences which could be religious in regards to rulership and government styles or a type of economy. Number two, conflicts over territorial boundaries. And number three, access to natural resources denied or restricted to foreign buyers. This problem of competitive nature between nations persists. In ancient times, it was between city-states. The question of state organization by each society has become vital to peaceful living. Why create a government if all governments contest each other's power and authority in efforts to rule their peoples independently of outside influences and possess their own territories? It seems to be embedded in the nature of man and his desire for safety and prosperity. Aristotle summed up this issue well. I'd like you to think of the following quote. When several villages are united in a single, complete community, large enough to be nearly or quite self-sufficient, the state comes into existence originating in the base needs of life, which of course would include food, shelter, and materials to survive. Aristotle continued with the following, and continuing in the existence for the sake of a good life. Man is by nature a political animal. The association of living beings who have this sense makes a family and a state. 
Justice is the bond of men and states. For the administration of justice, which is the determination of what is just, is the principle of order in a political society. Around 3000 BC, people of Mesopotamia developed canals to control and direct the violent and sudden floods caused by the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. This organization in an area surrounded by desert led to villages and then cities. Not everyone engaged in the production of food. In cities there were administrators to collect taxes, to pay for canal building, and town walls and buildings. There were craftsmen and artisans who worked with woods and metals to create tools, and harnessing for animals. When competition for resources arose, cities built higher walls as protection from outside threats. The 50-foot walls of Uruk are still visible and distinct from the desert floor and dunes today. Many first cities became religious and trade centers, controlled by a king said to have descended from the gods. This pattern continued for generations. The collection of taxes developed from the need for water and land. Bandits were frequent. Farmers with a surplus fed themselves, bought manufactured goods in the city after paying their taxes collected by administrators. Successful irrigation systems required people to live and work cooperatively, which is the basis of political unity. So there became centers of power, the king and the local city council of wise men and landowners. Early cities such as Babylon, Ur, Uruk, and Sumer were centers of power where law, custom, religion, and economics were administered by a king and government appointees loyal to serve. Like-minded citizens bonded together in unity under the power of the government and shared ties between members. These are cultural practices and systems of belief. The city-state was and is an independent urban political center that has control over resources such as land, water, and metal ore. With these resources, a civilization can survive, produce a surplus, and trade with their neighbors for things they cannot produce themselves. In 3000 BC, the term king emerged in Sumerian cities. Sumer was such a place. It was a religious center ruled by a man thought to be defended from the heavens. In time, city-states conquered one another for more political control and access to resources. When people came and moved from deserts to fortified cities, their social roles changed in addition to the type of economic pursuits as well, such as the way they produced food or the shelter that they lived in for their family groups. City women lost status as compared with their former roles they enjoyed in tribal bands. No longer were women praised, the societies such as the life-giving force. This was replaced with water and respect for the earth and land. Affluent women had more children that survived because of the access to better food and spent their time tending to the needs of their family. Non-elite women worked for others in domestic duties in the city, kept or became prostitutes, baked in homes, or worked in a shop and brewed beer. Mesopotamia 
did not have a large slave population until the Greeks and Romans came later. However, as seen on the Code of Hammurabi, slaves did exist in this society as workers and domestic servants. Typically, slaves were a product of war captives or people who had become indebted. Over time, people who toiled the land became more independent of their rulers and hired free laborers if they could afford it. This started a middle-class society to develop from wealthy trade merchants or farmers who could afford to have someone else do the work. With time to reflect, art refined along with musical talents and the invention of instruments such as the harp. Scribes were low-level administrators who made records on clay tablets and papyrus of the taxes collected from peasant farmers. Fathers wishing better lives for their sons paid to have them educated to work in the city. Studies seemed unnatural to a child who now lost his freedom to run and play and work on the family plot. But students writing of ancient texts and tax records enjoyed a better adult life. Administrators owned slaves and did not toil and work backbreaking duties their entire lives. Study then had good returns. It also paid well. After a generation or two, these clerks became politically important and wealthy. Literacy was the key to success in a writing civilization because knowledge was power. One of the oldest ancient texts to survive is the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. It is remembered as one of the most endearing Mesopotamian myths. His story is as old as it is current. An epic tale of travel, adversity, the search for immortality and the desire for a man-god to live forever. While this story illustrates the travel journey for truth by the main character Gilgamesh, such a king has been noted in early texts as a ruler dating back to about 2000 BC. Uruk is remembered as being a prominent city-state in the ancient period ruled by King Gilgamesh, though impossible to ascertain that the events recounted in the epic derive from this reign. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Great Flood, as narrated in the Bible, exists within this story. Gilgamesh searches for the peoples who survived the Great Flood who supposedly know the secrets to everlasting life. The twin themes of the unpredictability of the gods and inevitability of death dominate this epic. It is no coincidence that historians believe the epic of Gilgamesh is related somehow to the Bible story containing the story of the flood mentioned in the book of Genesis. In Old Babylonia, Hammurabi ruled Mesopotamia for 40 years until his death in 1750 BC. His principal achievement was unifying the Mesopotamian kingdom by controlling the Euphrates River. Though little is known about either his family life or the events of his reign, Hammurabi's military achievements are undoubted. His codes hold severe punishments for criminal offenses and made explicit the doctrine of an eye for an eye. The code was a compendium of early laws rather than an innovation of this Babylonian ruler. 
It tells us about the importance of writing and literacy among the elites of Babylonian society and about their well-developed notions of law and justice. The Code of Hammurabi, written about 1780 BC, is one of the earliest sets of laws found and one of the best preserved examples of this type of document from ancient Mesopotamia. The law code in Babylon was written on a black stone pillar that offered to the literate examples of the laws that would be and the punishments that they would experience in this land. Thus the traveler knew the laws of this city and the penalties for those who broke the king's word. It reveals social aspects of the city. This city was divided into classes. Men and women had different roles. Agriculture and property ownership was important and that there existed a class of unfree people. The laws, which numbered 1 to 282, however, there are some that are missing, such as number 13 and 66 through 99. Otherwise, these are inscribed on this 8-foot tall steel of black basalt. The code is often pointed to as the first example of the legal concept that some laws are very basic, as to be beyond the ability of even a king to change. By writing the laws on stone, they were forever. This concept lives on in most modern legal systems today, such as the phrase written in stone. The steel was discovered in December 1901 in Iran and is currently at the Louvre Museum in Paris, France. The Hammurabi laws do not accept excuses or explanations for mistakes or fault. The code was openly displayed for all to see and so that no man could plead ignorance of the law as an excuse. Few people, however, could read. Hammurabi felt he had to write the code to please the gods. Unlike many earlier and contemporary kings, he did not consider himself related to any god. Cuneiform writing took years to learn. It was performed on clay tablets with a wedge-shaped instrument. As mentioned, few were literate. Writing of tax records and the collection of taxes to support the city-state was a major feature of urban civilization. The building of city walls for defense and funding urban infrastructure costs money. Cuneiform script is one of the earliest known forms of written expression. Created by the Sumerians, cuneiform writing began as a system of pictographs. Over time, the pictorial representations became simplified and more abstract. Cuneiforms were written on clay tablets as mentioned. Symbols were drawn with a blunt reed the bending of the clay with this pen-like instrument made wedge shapes. This writing form developed by Sumerians inspired old Persian writing forms using an alphabet. Cultural traditions include religious beliefs. Like most religious structures, an examination of Egyptian gods offer a historical snapshot of this civilization, specifically how they thought about good and evil, and resolving age-old dilemmas such as the afterlife and man's purpose in the universe. Conflicts between Egypt's most important gods, this would be Isis 
Osiris, and their son Horus. And overcoming their problems parallels concepts of disorder and evil. These themes represent legendary terms, the significance of the unification of Egypt. The male husband god Osiris equated to order and virtue. His brother Seth equaled disorder and evil. Seth tricked Osiris into lying down inside a box that was to be his coffin. Then Seth sealed his brother inside of this box and sent it floating down the Nile. Well, this is what happened next. Osiris's wife and sister, Isis, found the box containing her husband. She brought Osiris home. Seth, motivated by hatred, recaptured the body, cut it into 14 pieces, and scattered the remains throughout Egypt and the Near East. Isis tracked down all of her husband's body parts, brought them home, and reattached them. And just in time, Isis briefly restored to life her husband, brother, long enough to conceive their son Horus. Later, Horus defeats Seth in battle. Horus became the god of the Egyptian kings, the first Egyptian god worshipped nationally. Belief in the afterlife and the stories, myths, offered explanations to what happens after death. Such beliefs inspired mummification of the dead. Those who could afford it were treated in this way after they died and a testament to funerary architecture that has survived until the present day is the Egyptian pyramids. These structures are believed to be the portal offering transit to the next world. The Book of the Dead is in many tombs. It was a how-to manual for royalty to ensure their immortality through spells and rituals for their journey to the afterlife. With the concern for the body, the mummification of royalty resulted from a concern over decomposition. Tombs were built outside the cities in the desert as not to waste farmland and were filled with fine household goods, food, pictures, and other luxuries. Books of the Dead constituted a collection of spells, charms, passwords, numbers, and magical formulas for the use of the deceased in the afterlife. At the geographical intersection between Asia and Africa, just west of the Red Sea, lies the Nile River in Egypt. The regional society established along this river produced a long-lasting and vibrant culture, government, and empire to which change was strictly forbidden. When humans lived in small tribal bands, they gravitated towards places with reliable sources of water food and shelter materials that would offer protection against the elements and not to forget predators as well. From about the 10th century BC, river peoples near the Nile began to domesticate grain, a storable food commodity that could not only last until the next season or year, but ward off starvation in bad seasons. Archaeologists and anthropologists involved in scientific inquiry since the 1800s have offered that pottery vessels have been considered the earliest records, going back to about 3200 BC, in which they contain Egyptian writing, specifically hieroglyphics. 
Egypt boasts the world's longest river. It flows mostly through the desert for about 600 miles. Herodotus, the 5th century Greek traveler, called Egypt the gift of the Nile. Flowing from a high elevation in the south, called Upper Egypt, to the lower, called Lower Egypt. Both Lower and Upper Egypt became unified in 3000 BC due to the kingship system in place and the military power of Lower Egypt. Until then, it had been smaller village settlements living independent along the Nile. Memphis, the capital, located on the Nile Delta close to the modern day city of Cairo. This was the seat of government. For 3,000 years, Egypt's empires rose and fell. The divine king they called a pharaoh. Like the mythical king of Uruk, Gilgamesh of Mesopotamia, pharaohs of Egypt were thought and revered as descended from the gods. Frequently they intermarried, including brother and sister, though not necessarily the same mother. It was this central mission of the pharaoh and his or her earthly duty to maintain order and balance. A pharaoh's death became an important symbol of this unity to the afterlife. Like for the city-states on or near the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia, Egypt was governed and in essence managed by local administrators. The main job by these bureaucrats was to collect the taxes and forward this money, typically paid in grain or other agricultural forms, to the government typically taxes that were paid equaled about half of the family's profits each year. Like in Mesopotamia, this money collected in Egypt paid for canals, roads, and palaces. It maintained the priests who ensured the survival and continuation of the religious structure and its traditions. Tax money paid for armies and the protection of its citizens. Tax money paid wages for national building projects and all associated costs, while this money collected paid for the wages of government workers. The administrative clerks were educated in writing traditions, math, and record keeping using hieroglyphics a system of writing and recording information or images on clay tablets. All the while, this tax money paid for expensive funerary architecture, known as the pyramids. Since the 19th century, we have been able to read hieroglyphics today because of the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. This surviving piece of granite contains three languages. This is Greek, and there's also two from Egypt, with hieroglyphics and also what's remembered as Egyptian demonic. Historians have dated this stone document, known as the Ptolemaic Decrees, to 196 BC. Its text comments on taxes and building forms. Unlike in Mesopotamia, a class-based society did not evolve in Egypt. Its structure was hierarchical. Pharaoh at the top with the royal family, then government administrators, then the priests. The rest of this society was made up of artisans, wealthy peasants and merchants. At the bottom of the social pyramid were the tomb builders, farmers, laborers, and slaves. While foreigners were not welcome, they did immigrate and settle in Egypt from other areas of the Mediterranean, Africa, and Asia. 
little is known of the common people. In Egyptian art, much is learned about elite society, rituals, religion, and burial practices. Like peoples of the Indus Valley and Mesopotamia, Egyptians were polytheistic, which is the worship of many gods of the natural world to create balance and harmony and to avoid famine, a symbol of disharmony with nature. Kings were often associated with the sun god Osiris, the life-giving force and renewal of the life cycle. Egyptians, rich and poor, took their religion seriously by building temples through worship and cult practices to a variety of deities. Unlike the Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations, to which an understanding of these cultures have survived through artifacts and architecture, the civilization of the Indus Valley was lost almost entirely. However, it was rediscovered by a British excavation team in the 1920s. Earlier clues were found in 1856 by the British in their efforts to build a railroad in India. The historical record, however, lies incomplete. The discovery of the stone seals, as what I've pictured here, and the fired bricks date back to their use around 4500 BC. The team that discovered this ancient city named one of them Harappa. Two cities were eventually found that supported 40,000 people. Today, Harappa is a city in Punjab, northeast Pakistan, located beside a former course of the Indus. The people of the Indus Valley civilization thrived along this water source. And in this zone, of today there is constant ethnic and religious strife. The Indus Valley arose as a site of two cities, as mentioned Harappa and also Mohenjo-Daro, about the same time as Mesopotamia and Egypt. This civilization was situated in a similar geographic location within near distance of a great river valley. After creating an agricultural surplus economy, an urbanized society developed. However, unlike in Egypt and Mesopotamia, this civilization did not continue to flourish and was lost to the Indian culture after 1900 BC, when an invasion of Aryan peoples came from Asia through the Khyber Pass in which they dominated ancient India. This was the same route that Alexander the Great and the Asian Mongols chose as well to invade and conquer. Harappa was a circular city as compared with Sumer, Uruk, and Memphis that took on fort-like shapes with angular features. In Harappa, streets were organized in a rectangular pattern to allow for wagon travel. Copper tablets and seal stones have been recovered in the thousands and contain a system of writing, but to date they are undecipherable. Harappa perhaps was a center of politics and or religion. Historians believe that the city served as an urban market too, with warehouses and systems of exchange that can only be imagined. Unfortunately, as indicated earlier, little is known at this time about how the people in the city lived, what government system they had, or what their rulers accomplished. This civilization, like others, harnessed water power by creating a series of canals. From 4500 BC, 
early Harappans kiln-fired bricks allowed for the construction of buildings. In time, this became a well-defined and organized city plan with water, trade, commerce, and urban living already in place. Similar to both the Mesopotamian and Egyptian people, Harappans were mostly farmers. Agriculture formed the basis of their economy. This civilization had giant granaries. Keep in mind, like other parts of the world, the collection of grain paid property taxes placed on the citizenry by their government. Governments needed money for continued operation of the infrastructure, such as canals and building projects. Military protection against invasion and other issues, such as paying government workers. This society, with its building projects, were mass producers of fired bricks. This superior brick endured the test of time. The Harappans possessed a well-designed written language. Civilizations to be considered as such need to have a developed language in written form. For the Harappans, they produced seals containing pictures of animals. These images illustrate a wet, marshy environment. The seals pictured included wild rhinos, tigers, and some with elephants. A variety of domesticated animals too, such as cats, if you consider a cat domesticated, along with goats, camels, dogs, sheep, and water buffalo. Most of the city building types in Harappa were private residences, of good quality too, to which one might claim Harappan city life was apparently quite good. In this civilization, Harappan citizens had drains, sewers, and even toilet systems in their homes and other structures. Now this slide and why I've included it not only shows a trading network, but it shows the expanse of this trading network as I've listed here items that were bought and sold as far away as 2,000 miles. So take a moment to take a look at this. Know the trade routes in the ancient world, reaching to each river civilization until about the fall of Troy by 1250 BC.